We are here in Hopkinton on part of Center Trail with Peter Legoy today. Often you might see him running fast in town or perhaps busy behind the scenes on in his work in Hopkinton or maybe out in the fields and streams for his job. We are going to take a few minutes and have a seat here in the middle of Center Trail and have a talk with him about his life and his work and his love of being out in nature. Hi, Peter. Uh, thank you for meeting today for Meet Your Neighbor. Uh, here we are on the side of Center Trail in Hopkinton, and it's a beautiful spring day. And we are settled here because it's one of the places that you frequent in Hopkinton. I am wondering if you could just tell a little bit about why Center Trail is meaningful to you. Well, Center Trail is actually a project that I initially worked on um, as part of Downtown Revitalization Committee. Um, we were looking for projects, things to use the Community Preservation Committee money. I was looking for a project that would allow people to get outdoors and use the outdoors, but then be close enough to go down and use and go to a restaurant in town. Something similar, the Milford Trail was going in at that time, mm -hmm. and so that was kind of the impetus for the idea. Um, the center trail was there. The work had been done previously by Lisa Jackson and, and other folks, mm -hmm. but the surface was such that it would get very wet. Um, the area that we're in now actually um, used to look a little like a trout stream oh, uh -huh. in the spring, and that's not good for running on. It's not good for use by bikers. So what we wanted to do was put a, a multi-use surface down, which is the stone dust surface that you see around us now. Hmm. Um, and we had the the channel was originally there. This used to be a rail bed, a railroad bed. Um, railroad went down to Milford. And the channel over there was designed to hold water um, to prevent sparks from being a problem. It was also obviously keep the water off the, the track. So we, but we had to expand that a little bit to make it more usable um, mm -hmm. to keep the water off the trail. Mm -hmm. So that's why this has a lot of meaning to me as we spent a fair amount of time. I got money through town ma town meeting mm -hmm. and um, acted as the clerk of the works. Wow. John Coolidge, who was formerly in town, um, was chairman of that committee and he said, I'll give you the money, but the, the catch is that you have to be clerk of the works for the project. So that's why I <laughs> became clerk of the works. Mm -hmm. So, it's, But it's been a great project. Quite a project. How long ago was that? That started in 2011. Okay. Um, mm -hmm got the money. We had to do a lot of uh, work through the Conservation Commission, make sure we got all the permitting and, and mm -hmm. getting all the procedures in place to make it work. And then most of the work was actually done a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. um, the by actual footprint, by various contractors, contractors. that I would hire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And we're still, we're still going on that. The Upper Charles Committee has been put in place to mm -hmm. sort of finish up the rest of the work. But um, Scott Curran from Homesite is the contractor who's currently working on the, the next stretch of the trail, which goes from the other side of the loop road here over to Chamberlain Street. So he's got that, hopefully have the base coat done today. Wow, wow. So, or oh, that's today exciting. or tomorrow, he's hoping to get it finally in there. He put mm -hmm. a lot of it in before the, the snows came, but yeah. <laughs> he had to stop. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's quite an accomplishment of a project in a short amount of time, really. And would you say that the trail is limited to a certain population, the runners only, or who can use this trail? Pretty much anyone can use it. No mechanized vehicles, with okay. the exception we have. Mike Bolson is a local who lives here, and he has a little golf cart that he runs up and down, but he mm. does a great job just kind of keeping the trash off and sticks ah. cleared off. And mm. if there's a bigger problem, he'll let me know, and we'll come down with chainsaws, but he'll oftentimes even do that work. So. Uh -huh. Mike does a great job, but other than that, no mechanized vehicles, but bikes, walkers, bikers. The idea of the trail was to allow wheeled vehicles to use it, so mm -hmm. it is good for that purpose. Dogs? Uh, dogs, absolutely. Dogs? Okay. Please uh -huh. pick up after your dogs if right, you're going to use yeah. it, but uh -huh. you know, or, or at least kick the leavings Dog. off to the That's side. Right. It is uh -huh. the woods. <laughs> but uh -huh. Don't uh -huh. leave the little blue bag sitting on the trail. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yep. So it is a beautiful trail, and um, we passed a snake that you pointed out earlier, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of signs of spring around here. Um, I, do, 
in your connections with nature? Can you point out anything that's happening right around us that we might not necessarily know? right now? Well, the people at home on TV probably can't see the gnats that are flying around us, but we're certainly of aware here. of That's them. Right. And they're blooming and they'll yeah. act actually as a good food for the next sort of series of critters, amphibians, frogs, salamanders that come along and, ah. and larger insects. So that's actually a good thing, even though we don't like it. Mm. Same with mosquitoes. We don't like them, but they're actually mm -hmm. a good food source. Good. Uh -huh. um, in this immediate vicinity, we have some interesting things in terms of the dead ash trees behind us here. Hmm. The ash has got some sort of blight. They were a pretty dominant tree and still are, but if you go in the woods, you'll see an awful lot of them have come down. Mm -hmm. um, some sort of blight's killing them off, so that's kind of too bad. But yeah. something else will come in and take their place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you can start to see the buds. It's a little hard, yeah. but the, mm -hmm. just the tips of the buds are going. Mm -hmm. um, the edge behind you, you can see it's mostly grass up there. That was, we actually planted that with a wildflower mix. So I'm wow. still waiting for the wildflower wow. portion to kick in. So mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see what happens mm. with that. Um, but it's, it's still sort of the start of spring, but you can see the little start of the greening going on a, along the edges, particularly down closer to the water where yeah. that's running. Sure is a welcome sight uh, for all of us and to come out on the trail and see evidence of what is growing after the big banks of snow that yes. we went through over winter. Um, I know, what would you say has been one of your uh, most interesting discoveries either here on Center Trail, I know you use other trails, um, and you are very connected with nature since you were a child. Can you think of anything in particular that was a very exciting moment of discovery with wildlife or uh, plant life or? Well, running on the trail and then on other trails around, it's always neat to see the wildlife that's gone through either, you know, ideally actually seeing it. I've seen the coyote, there's a coyote that likes living down further down the trail where there's a ravine and, ah. and a, a field, a, a young one. So they, they wow. tend to be a little dumber. They'll stand around and watch you for a while. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. a fisher that runs back and forth across the area. And then we certain, oftentimes we'll see deer uh -huh. on the trail or uh -huh. hanging out in the area. Wow. Uh -huh. um, and as we work on the trail going over to Chamberlain Street, there's a pretty large group that loves to hang out really close to that trail for whatever reason. Of so. deer. Yes, mm -hmm. and deer, so mm -hmm. they're they're fun to see. Uh huh. Um, about that. Yeah. But well, yeah, it's uh, you know seeing the wildlife is always sort of a, a special moment when that happens. That's you, right. You see something go by. Running, you have a better chance sometimes mm -hmm. than than if you're mm -hmm. hiking. But either way, it works yeah. nicely. Well, that's nice to know for people who take the trail and they can get a little closer up to wildlife right near mm -hmm. neighborhood, right nearby. But let's talk about running. Uh, running is a very important part of your life. Uh, we might see you on the sidewalks or on the trails, no matter the season. Running's a big <laughs> part of who you are. Can you tell a little bit about how you're involved with running? Yes, I've been running since high school. I actually had an old farmer friend that I used to go visit, and I would go round up his cows for him. Oh. <laughs> and in trotting off across the field, he said, you had a pretty good running stride. And ah. So I thought I took that as a sign that I'd go out for the high school cross country team, which I quite me. enjoyed. Yeah, well, the farmer friend, he then yeah. proceeded to spend lots of time telling me how it was gonna ruin my knees, uh, uh -huh. um, which it hasn't. Oh, good, So, good. But I've uh -huh. really enjoy running. I, it, it allows me to combine the sort of competitive aspect mm -hmm. of things and, and camaraderie that comes with running, mm -hmm. but then also being outside and, and getting out on trails and seeing a chance to get out near wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, so I quite enjoy it. It's, a wonderful way for me to get out and, and sort of be in nature. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've really enjoyed sort of, as I said, the competitive aspect of it yeah. too. I've run, um, I run for the Hopkinton Running Club, but I okay. also run competitively for the Greater Lowell Road Runners. Okay. And in large races. part, and they're up in Lowell, mm -hmm. in large part because they run cross country races, which okay. is mm -hmm. something that people typically do in, in more in high school, but mm -hmm. for us older people doing it, it's, it's still a lot of fun and mm -hmm. getting out as a team and trash talking the other teams. And, <laughs> but just again, really it's for the camaraderie at the end of the day. So yeah, really yeah. How long have that. you been a part of that 
I've been a part of that since I turned 50, so for about five years. And right. We've gone off to national races. Wow. And we were third one year uh -huh. in a very, very close race. We got beat by a team from Vermont and then a team from Seattle. Mm -hmm. So that wow. was that's quite that was something. Fun. Yeah. But again, for us older folks, it was really a fun race, a yeah. fun chance to get out there and, and sort of see how you fit mm -hmm. with other people of your same age. Mm -hmm. How about that? Well, uh, and how about the marathon? Well, yes, as a, someone who lives in Hopkinton, mm -hmm. one has to have run the Boston Marathon. So I have run that several <laughs> times. Um, marathon's not my favorite distance, although I've um, done a bunch of them and mm -hmm. I've spaced them out nicely. So I've got uh, five decades. Between 1970s and 2010s, I've run a sub three hour marathon in each of those 10 year period. So uh -huh. uh, there's about 30 of us in the in the world who have run wow. um, there are five decades of, of sub three. So I'm, uh -huh. I'm one of those people, even though it's certainly not my favorite. I'm one of the slower ones on that list, by the way. That's still quite something. That's so, impressive. You'll keep yes. going. I will keep going. Mm -hmm. um, my latest challenge is uh, when I turned 50, I wanted to do a 50 something. Um, and uh, so I did a 50K race, so that's 31.1 miles, wow. which actually worked out really well. It was, it was a lot of fun because you're running about a minute and a half per mile slower than your marathon pace and you're eating the whole time. You're eating the whole time. Yes, because okay. you have to keep your nutrition up. It's very important for those are called ultra marathons. Yeah. Uh -huh. So having done that and found that fun, I decided to sign up for a 50 miler because that's oh my gosh. what Whoa. they consider the real <laughs> ultra marathons when you get yeah. up over 50. So what is the trick to doing a 50? I don't know. We'll yeah. find out. <laughs> and I, and uh -huh. I may not know it. Yeah. Uh -huh. so and when is this? That's in the end of May. Okay. It'll wow. be out in Ithaca, New York. So wow. that should be an interesting race. Uh -huh. um, a lot of training for that. Mm -hmm. I'm but sure. More that is... one long run or a couple of long runs back to back versus a lot more miles. I'm not really doing any more miles yeah. than I was previously doing. So that's over two marathons in one. Yes. And how much time is that? It will probably be, under... be around 10 hours. <laughs> uh -huh. But you're walking for a lot of it. I mean, yeah. it's, it's uh -huh. not you're running the whole time. Okay. Wow. Well, that, that's quite impressive. So, uh, Best wishes yeah. as you carry on running. Um, and uh, you're also someone, as we s had talked about, being very connected with nature um, since childhood, from what I understand. Can you talk about your early roots of how you became so interested in work, in, in life, in your you know, recreational time? Sure. Um, my father always was outdoors. I mean, he grew up, he had pet baby squirrels and was mm -hmm. always interested in wildlife. Where was this? That was down in northwestern Connecticut. Okay. We grew up in New Hartford, Connecticut, okay. which is mm -hmm. sort of on the edge of the Berkshires. It's a really pretty nice area. Mm -hmm. I actually met down there with some college friends um, recently. We were looking for places to go. We get together every few years and mm -hmm. I said, gee, you know, where I grew up is actually kind of a vacation spot. So we were down there this past summer and ah. had, a, had a great time. We went canoeing and mm -hmm. um, did a trail race and we ran together in college mm -hmm. and then um, also did played golf and other mm -hmm. similar mm -hmm. activities and ate a lot and drank. So uh -huh. we, had a, yeah. we had a good time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, from my father's um, interest in the outdoors, he was always fishing, um, yeah. going hunting, mm -hmm. just going out for hike, hiking around and he knew a lot of nature so he was a sort of great naturalist and mm -hmm. sort of taught us all to, to know a lot about our surroundings in the woods mm -hmm. so and you know the, with the running um, that allows me to be outside but it's really nice to be outside and sort of know what's going on around you so mm -hmm. I try to sort of learn what the plants and animals are and know a lot of the trees I'm not so good on, on smaller plants but mm -hmm. uh, but he taught us a lot of those things, mm -hmm. so that's the, wow. the background for that. Yeah, what an important foundation, really, that more of us should have uh, that you experienced. And then it went with you, not only uh, in school when you're running, chasing the cows and <laughs> learning about uh, running um, for sport, but also you went on to college. I know your work is related to environmental uh, issues, but um, did you study 
science or environmentalism in college or some other place? Yes, I, I have um, a bachelor's and master's in biology, mm -hmm. both from Georgetown. Mm -hmm. um, focus there was not so much on outdoors in terms of where Georgetown's focus was, but there were enough professors there who had um, plant biology and ecology and um, entomology, the study of insects, as, mm -hmm. as their interests. And so that was kind of, I was able to gravitate to those people. Um, one professor in particular, Donald Spoon, had, was a great protozoologist, so studying really, really tiny creatures. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he had some wonderful techniques. If you can imagine um, senior year, college, Friday night at 8 o'clock, our lab got over at six or seven, and we'd all still be there staring into a microscope, wow. looking at the kind of cool beasties that he was showing to us. So, uh -huh. you know, you just, That's impressive, he was an amazing right? teacher. <laughs> the yeah, other students so. weren't doing that probably. Uh, well, our whole, our whole community was, <laughs> yes. but yeah. Uh -huh. so, yeah, wow, and so interesting beasties. Very interesting, were. yeah, what you, what you could see in a little Petri dish of, of water that he, mm -hmm. with critters, he would, he was great for that sort of, again, just a pure naturalist telling mm -hmm. us and showing us some really neat critters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that, from that then, I went on to work for a consulting firm looking at the health effects of chemicals mm -hmm. and then working with them, part of that then become looking at the health effects to ecological organisms. Wow. So um, I've done both. Most of my work is, is in fact looking at health effects of chemicals mm -hmm. upon um, environment. on humans, but I've also done a fair bit of work. I can also evaluate effects to ecological organisms as well. Okay. And what is the title of the work you do now? Well, um, it's basically called risk assessment. Mm -hmm. So it's okay. looking at how much of a chemical is present in the environment hmm. in an area mm -hmm. that, that perhaps has been contaminated mm -hmm. and then what someone's exposure to that chemical might be. Okay. Um, I did some of the early work in that area because EPA came out with this whole program, Superfund, that was designed to look at, you know, how clean do you have to clean up these Superfund sites mm -hmm. and then really had no idea of how to estimate how much someone might get exposed to. They knew how toxic the chemicals were, but mm -hmm. In toxicology, how much you're exposed to is very important. It, it matters almost as much as how toxic the chemical is. So mm -hmm. if you have a very toxic chemical, but nobody can touch it, mm -hmm. nobody cares. Mm -hmm. If you have a moderately toxic chemical that it has a lot of exposure, that's a real problem. Yeah. So they didn't know how to study that stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, one, of the, one of my early papers was on soil ingestion, how much dirt to kids eat because Whoa. you needed to figure out how much chemicals were in the dirt. Yeah. We knew that kids touched the dirt, but how much dirt did they actually get into their mouths? So that was one of my early papers. It's still used today. The, wow. It's, it's the basis for some of the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protections How about work. that? Were so. you a dirt eater? Did this come from personal? I don't, don't know. <laughs> no, I was a little young at that uh -huh. time. I know one of my daughters was, and that, yeah. that is really a a great question to ask, you know, how close our children come to some of the chemicals, the harmful chemicals yeah, around us. It, yeah, and really important thing for us to be uh, looking into uh, right. in our world as we get more and more away from the natural world. So, um, and so you do this work uh, that is important for environment and for people. And you also are a father and a husband. You have a blended family of uh, five children. Yes. Uh huh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so um, that is a, a significant job as well in life. And uh, so I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about family life, blended family life in Hopkinton and with your work and the balancing of it in addition to running and training for 50 mile marathons. <laughs> yeah, well, right now it's actually our, our blended family is down to um, my wife, Amanda Maffei, yeah. my son, Sam. Mm -hmm and myself in, in the house. But when we first moved into that house, there were um, four children mm. 
and then Sam came along afterwards. Um, so we had to end up with a five bedroom house, which, yeah. which ended mm -hmm. up working. But mm -hmm. the, the children, Al my daughter Alice is 22. She attended Gonzaga, graduated from mm -hmm. there and is still out in Spokane. Wow. And my son, Charlie, was at Montana State. Now he's mm. taking a little more time off and he's actually out in Bozeman, Montana. They're in beautiful places of nature, aren't and, they? Yeah. Yep, and as I tell people, they're right down the road. Right down the road. I can, I can <laughs> hop on the same road of. five minutes from here, <laughs> and, which is Route 90, and it goes all the way out there. So how they're 2,000 miles away, but they're right down the road. Oh, how about that? Isn't that That's a good way sort to of look strange? at it. Mm. And then Dylan and Christina, both Campbell, um, are Amanda's two children, and, mm -hmm. and they're, again, they both graduated, they're older. Uh, Dylan works for Whole Foods and Christina works actually here in Hopkinton hmm. um, over doing food, food service at EMC. Ah, and she mm -hmm. has a daughter, our granddaughter, Cora. Ah, so your grandparent so, as well. Exactly. Wow. So we oh. get to, to do some grandparent time mm -hmm. occasionally. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, a very full and uh, life with a lot of contribution in different places. What would you offer maybe a new new families, uh, people who are new to parenting and balancing <laughs> parenting and career and uh, life uh, beyond, maybe if it's running or writing poetry, whatever? Mm -hmm. Well, I've always thought it's important to keep a balance in your life. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean you're not focusing on your job or you're not focusing on, you know, obviously you have certain things, job and family, family and job really in that order are the, are the most critical mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Um, but you, you also have to have balance and, and do the things you like to do. Mm -hmm. um, and that can include, for me, it's running. You said poetry. I think it's important to balance even your, your interests. Um, I also obviously work in town government. I think it's, invali that's it's right. very important to volunteer mm -hmm. and to give back mm -hmm. to the community. I think that's what makes really our country, um, and, and I'm such a great place as so many people contribute and, and I'm always intrigued to find out what people do to give back and, and all, so many times people are doing things that are you just don't hear about mm -hmm. that you know everyone does a little bit of, of something different I mean so many people are involved in, in this town in the sports and coaching and other people are involved in Boy Scouts and it may be completely different groups of people but it's just really I love seeing so many people mm -hmm. contributing in so many different ways mm -hmm. it's really a, a neat function but mm -hmm. I think for me that's just part of the whole balance that I think is really important mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it, it all fits in together uh, with, mm -hmm. and helps to feel I would imagine for a more connected sense of life and what I understand is important to you about say working on center trail um, working out in environment um, for a community to mm -hmm. feel more connected yeah I actually I actually have a good example which is not with this community but with Ashland um, I was at a music event that Amanda was playing at um, just at a house party um, at the Kess at Barbara Kessler's mm -hmm. in Phil's and got talking with somebody from Ashland about Warren Woods because they were in the process of buying that land. Mm -hmm. One of the issues there was there was some elevated arsenic levels that had been found in the soils and of mm -hmm. course our, everyone gets concerned about arsenic yeah. but arsenic and lead arsenates were very very common pesticides used throughout probably for a hundred years in this country and in the soil they really don't pose much of a risk. They're naturally occurring, particularly in the Worcester area, at very high levels. Mm. Um, and they don't really pose that much of a risk as long as you're not having your kid play directly in those soils. Mm. In the Warren Woods situation, um, I was able to use my training as a risk assessor to talk to, the, to those folks and say, gee, you don't need to spend a million dollars to clean up that area because people are not going to be using the woods in that way. They're simply walking over the over that area. And I, through them, got in touch with the person who was involved in, in Warren Woods. And we were actually able to convince the selectman, again, working through another friend of mine. He wasn't able to use me to do the actual calculations, but I got another friend professionally that I work with involved and we did the calculations for them to show that there really wasn't any health risk to people mm -hmm. using 
the trails in there mm -hmm. and there was no reason to spend a million dollars to clean it up so they were able to actually use risk assessment mm -hmm. to further a community mm -hmm. activity which mm -hmm. was the Warren Woods project wow. and I think they're ultimately going to be able to use that money which had been put in escrow mm -hmm. to build a nice barn over there that they can then use for community events so wow, it's it's using that? the professional experience to work with the community, community well. on a outdoor nature related project it was mm -hmm. really kind of wow. it was kind of a fun thing to watch it all to come to fruition to. yeah, yeah. well wow. well we have two minutes left and i didn't want to skip that you are also a poet and a writer and uh, i know the poem that uh, i asked you to bring one in, and the title is the bridge um, but i'm thinking uh, as you have been talking about how important community is to you and your work and your uh, community involvement in organizations. You had a nice way of putting it. Uh, uh, if we all get more connected to our communities, we learn from our differences and maybe there would be uh, less difficulty getting along, all of us, uh, mm -hmm. a really nice way of putting it. And I thought, oh, uh, how how symbolic in a way. You have a poem about the bridge uh, after all that you've said. And I wonder if you could end by reading. I know it's a physical bridge uh, that you speak yes. of, but it sounds like you're doing important bridge work in your life <laughs> in many special ways. So thank yes. you. And if you could just end with your poem. Sure. So the, the poem is Small Bridge. On the way home, I cross a small bridge over the railroad tracks. Looking left and right down the long tracks, no trains just endless possibilities. To left, straight tracks to the Atlantic, stretching to continents and oceans beyond, forever sea of endless possibilities. To right, tracks stretching to Worcester, then west and south and north, intertwining labyrinth covering the spaces of America, thousands of miles and millions of people, billions, endless possibilities. I cross the small bridge, I drive to my house, I pick up the kids and I think, life here is quieter than the ocean, less expansive than the West, but still, the possibilities, endless. Wow. Thank you so much. That's a beautiful poem. And I hope uh, we hear more of it uh, shared out in community as well. Thank you so much yes. for being here as a part of the program today. Well, thank you. It's a fun program. <laughs>